Okay. 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 He's an expert in technology and its impact. There's a wonderful booklet which is available on the, on the Google. You must, you must read it of bikes, bake light, and bulbs. Uh, I had the occasion of reading it in the last one week. And of course, I'm sure we'll be debating some aspects of what he's discussing. But what I would only say is this. Today, in the next one hour of his speech and maybe an hour later when we debate, we will once again benefit from the world of academics so that the quality of what we debate in Mandalay can be of a different grade, can be of a different class from what we were doing and this is something which me and Ajay always discuss and I am sure that you will find that this will raise the level of what we are discussing to a higher plane. Professor Baikar. Vikram, Vikram. Yeah, one minute. National. Yeah. Before we start, we can be, as we the custom, we will start with the national. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a very tall order that Vikram has given me. Um, the only thing I can say in return that I'm very happy to be here. I was scheduled to be sitting somewhere there in November, but my plane was delayed. Um, so this is a bit too quick of a promotion for me, but I'll try to do my best. Um, let's see whether the remote works. The title was Technology and Culture. What I want to argue is something much more radical. What I want to argue tonight is that we should think about technological culture as one concept, as one way of describing our world. That is the message that I'm trying to convey to you. I will argue that we live in a technological culture, whether it's in Holland or in Hyderabad or in a very small finish like Panukula, where they move to non-pesticide forms of agriculture. <coughs> so the purpose is, first, to give you a bit of background. I mean, you, you, you hire an academician and then you get the review. I apologize, so I'll <laughs> explain where this all came from. Um, but I also try to argue what it buys us. <coughs> why would you, why would it make sense to listen to an academic like me in the first place? What does this whole concept of technological culture buy you? That's what I'm trying to do. And I'll try to use examples as much as possible. Let's first define the terms. I'll come to technology in a minute. When I say culture, I'm using culture in the anthropological sense of the word. What I mean is Culture describes the ways in which we people interact with each other, the way that we interact with the world, the way that we give meaning to the world. Um, it means that, as in Dutch we would say, I'm not talking about culture with a capital C, the culture of the high arts, the culture of which in the Indian, in the, the Indian times of Tuesday, I saw a quotation of some author, Sharat Chandra, in 1926, who said, Muslims do not have culture. That is not the concept of culture that I'm using. Apart from that, I disagree with the guy. It's not the concept that I'm using. I'm using the concept that basically says, any group of people that lives together has a culture. The Dutch have a culture, the Maastricht people, the city where I live, have a culture, my university has a culture, my department has a culture. 
Mantan is a culture in some sense. I could study Mantan as an anthropologist by sitting in the audience, by giving a talk, checking how you react to questions, see which jokes you don't understand, which jokes you laugh at. That would be the anthropological study of your culture of Mantan. So that's the concept that I'm using. And I realize that I'm making life very difficult for the videographer, but I can't stand still. <laughs> What is technology? For me, technology basically, but I'll make things much more complicated when we proceed during the evening. But for a start, technology is at least three things. First of all, it is what you all think of. Things, bicycles, video cameras, micro, uh, this sort of thing. But it's also practices. It's, it's also the practice of knowing that I shouldn't keep it as close to my mouth as that. Um, Evidently, pop stars have a much better practice of using this piece of, this piece of technology, but practices go into an understanding of what technology is. You can't have artifacts, things, without the ways to use them and, and the knowledge to, to deal with them. That's the third point. So knowledge goes into technology as well. It's not just the things. It's not just the practices of using it, it's also the understanding that is part of my definition of technology. Now, the big question that I'll be talking about tonight, and it's basically all what I can talk about ever, it's what my research and my teaching is about, is what is the relation between technology and society? What happens if you start to make a nano car in India? What changes does that have as an effect on infrastructure, on mobility, on employment, on maybe air pollution? Uh, what relations and how does a certain community, a certain society come to the idea and create the possibility to create a nano car and other, and other societies create fuel slobbering huge cars um, and don't think of something like a nano? So that question, how does society relate to technology, that's my main agenda. The background, the review, where does this come from? What is, how, I'm, and I'm doing this not because I want to give you any book knowledge, but because I think that after I've shown you where it comes from, you'll better understand what my proposal tries to solve. I briefly review the way that uh, academics, and that's a mixed bag of sociologists, engineers, historians, have looked at the relation between technology and society, the first period, and, and it started, you can't read that, but it says 1940 to 1980. There wasn't any thinking about it before the 1940s. So the first period, 1940 to 1980, the only question on the agenda was, what impact does technology have on society? What effects does it have in terms of pollution? That was not the question raised, but that's what we would label now there. Effects on employment, on, um, on races, those questions were asked, particularly in the United States. Uh, so what are the effects of technology on society? That changed, that changed in the 1980s. Rather than only asking what is the effect of technology on society, now the focus in the 1980s, the focus came on can we understand the development of technology by itself. That was not the agenda here. Here it was assumed that technology develops, no one asked why, it was assumed it would, it would have some sort of internal logic, and the question was only about the impact. In the 1980s the question became can we understand the development of technology. The question of the impact sort of was, was put on the back burner. Now that changed after that, and now I would say the focus is on technological culture. I'll be talking much more about that. And the idea is that in the beginning, first period, it's about the technology having an impact on society. Then the solution to the question, how does technology develop, that the answer came it develops because of some social 
influences. I'll say much more about that in a minute. And currently, the research is about the interaction between technology and society. Can we understand both the impact of technology on society and the way that society is shaping technology? At the background of everything that I'm saying tonight is a critique of technological determinism. Technological determinism means two things. It means that technology develops autonomously and that technology determines society. So that is the, that is the basic view that we call technological determinism and I'm claiming that that is the basic view that most people, most citizens, most policy makers, most politicians, even today, have of the relation between society and technology. Most of them will think that technology develops, they can't influence it, it develops, it has effects on their life. Um, I guess that, that you are of the generation that, that, that remembers the time when you had uh, records, I mean these music records, um, well, I had them, and I had a very beautiful collection, and at some point, um, everyone was moving to CDs. I couldn't repair my gramophone, I couldn't buy new records, I could only buy a CD player and new CDs. That certainly did not give me the feeling that I had anything to say about that choice. I felt as if technology was sort of rolling over me and pushing me and, and obliging me to move from the gramophone and the records to the CDs. So it's not a silly idea, this technological determinism. It is, it is an idea, it's a theory, to say it a bit, more, a bit more pretentiously. It's a theory that makes a lot of sense of all our daily experiences. But there is a problem with it. There are two problems with it. The first problem is that it is politically debilitating. I'll explain that in a minute. And secondly, happily enough, it's false. When I say that technological determinism is debilitating, what I mean is that, just think of it a minute. If really technology develops autonomously, you can't steer it, you can't change it. It doesn't make to have any political debate about technology because it's autonomous anyway. So if you seriously think that technological determinism describes the relation between technology and society, you can give up any political discussion about technology. Give up any discussion about nuclear power in India. Give up any discussion about big dams or small forms of decentralized uh, irrigation. Because progress, that's then the slogan, progress dictates the development of technology. You can't stop it, you can't steer it, it's autonomous and it will affect society. That's what I mean with it is politically debilitating. It makes you stupid, politically speaking. Now, happily enough, it's also false. Let's see whether there is another bit. Yes. A lot of the research that has been going on and that I'm part of, partly historical research, partly anthropological research, has shown that this just is not the case. Technology is not developing autonomously. You can, we can, we scholars have in a variety of studies now for about, uh, for about 20 years, have shown in very different fields of technology, very different contexts of society, that technology actually, um, I'll try to keep the distance a bit, a bit more fixed, that technology is actually shaped by social circumstances. What is more, that you can shape it strategically, that you can have a discussion, we want to move there with society or there, and depending on that, we develop our technology differently. There is a lot of empirical research sustaining that, let's call it falsification of technological determinism. I'm not saying that everyone, politicians, policy makers, citizens, grasp this falsification, but I think we have shown that it isn't working and the rest of the talk is to show what other form of understanding of the development of technology, the relation with society and the politics behind this can now inform us.
So, to sum up, and to set the agenda for the rest of the evening, um, the old view of technological determinism does not work. It doesn't work to help understand the world in which we live, and it does not work to make a better world, to use technology to improve our world. So, the challenge that I'm now setting myself is to convince you of another view, another view than technological determinism, to put it pretentiously, to offer you another theory about the relation between technology and society that would be able, that will be able to make better sense of the world and to actually help us build a better world. So that's the agenda for the rest of the evening. My answer is this approach or theory called the social construction of technology, for short, Scott. And I'll introduce it with an example of a very really Dutch example of the bicycle. What I'll try to do to you is to show you how that bicycle can be described in a way that shows its social shapedness and that does not use technological determinist view. So what I have to do in order to do that convincingly is to show that it that the bicycle did not develop in, as a, the result of a kind of autonomous development. Um, that, that we can understand it not as if just the technology itself dictated my story. Um, I will use an anthropological way of studying the bicycle and that means very concretely that I'm going to use the views of the people that worked with the bicycle, around the bicycle, to describe that development. So although it happened more than 100 years ago, I'll play the anthropologist, the historical anthropologist. I'm, I have used it partly in the book that, that Fika mentioned. Um, I used lots of sor sources, also diaries, literary sources, patents, technical drawings, to grasp as an anthropologist the world around the bicycle, the culture around the bicycle, to try to understand how it developed. Okay, I won't do all the social groups, I'll take two social groups, because hey, remember I'm, doing the I'm playing the anthropologist, I want to describe the bicycle through the eyes of the, the people that work with it. The first social group that I'll describe to you are women. Women wanted to bicycle, but they were not allowed to. We are talking about Victorian times in Britain, and women were generally not supposed to behave in a very ostentatious, open way. And can you imagine something more ostentatious than being about at this level, the level of tall man in the open street with a lot of wind under your skirts. So evidently women were not supposed to bicycle. Um, but they wanted to bicycle. And that's why it's relevant to ask them to, to look at their diaries. I, one of the diaries I used was a granddaughter of, uh, of Darwin to, to use their view of bicycles to understand what bicycles are. But I first have to prove to you that they were actually interested in bicycles. And this picture is to prove that. The argument behind the picture, and the argument is the argument of an engineer in Britain, engineer Stanley, he argued, well, if Queen Victoria herself is allowed to ride a horse like this, I don't know the English word for you, you know how she does it. Uh, if she is allowed to sit on a horse at the same height with two legs on one side of the horse, then surely women would be allowed to ride a bicycle if only the two legs are on one side. So let's design a bicycle that allows that. And that's what he did. If you, so both legs are on the left side. Um, he succeeded in doing that by having the front wheel and the, and the, and the rear wheel not in one line, but slightly uh, apart, so that the point of gravity is in the middle. And there is a very complicated, very clever uh, mechanism of, of, of two pedals that move up and down. The thing exists. It's still visible in London in the Science Museum. I have seen it. But it was not a big commercial success. I'm not sure how many bicyclists are among the audience, but even if you're not, or in the past, haven't practiced bicycling, you will, ex you will ex 
except, I suppose, from a Dutchman, that what we do when we fall bicycling is we basically stretch one leg, and that'll brace us. It's, in that sense, it's a pretty safe, it's a pretty safe bicycle that we currently have. You can't, if you don't go too fast, and if cars don't roll over you, I guess that's why you don't have them in either boat. <laughs> then you can't really fall, you will brace yourself with your leg. Now, think of that woman falling that way. By the time her hand reaches the ground, she's going so fast that that must break. And that's it. So it's, really, it's a nasty machine in that sense. It proves that I mean, Stanley had enough of a marketing idea that he made this whole thing. Uh, that women really wanted to bicycle, but then they made up their mind and this was too dangerous and he didn't sell them. Okay, so now I have proved the point that women are worth looking at if I want to understand the culture of bicycling. Now, what did they see? What was the meaning of the bicycle for them? That's the next picture. Even though this is a man and that is a man, the identity of the bicycle, this high-wheeled, ordinary bicycle, as it was called in Britain, basically is that it's a very dangerous machine. Now, now I'm not talking about the normal bicycle, so not the bicycle that was a commercial success. Um, you don't need a complete flock of sheep like this one. Uh, just a stone or a hole in the road, and there were lots of stones and holes in the road in Victorian times in Britain, was enough to make you fall like this. You would be catapulted up from. The only thing you could do about it is, um, and they called that coasting, was to throw your legs over the handlebar and just hope the best of it. <laughs> and that if you would fall, you would at least be catapulted up front and hopefully land on your feet. Um, these bicycles didn't have proper brakes, so that was not a solution. Um, there were lots of sheep, there were lots of stones, so the best you could do was this. Basically, basically, it was a very dangerous machine. Maybe I should add, it wasn't just a dangerous machine, it was also a pretty stupid machine. Because 300 years earlier, Leonardo da Vinci had designed the bicycle that we are currently using. We found a drawing, uh, an original drawing from the atelier, from the workshop, of Leonardo da Vinci, the two relatively low wheels, the chain drive on the rear wheel, the whole thing was made of wood rather than metal. That's the only difference. So it's not only a dangerous thing, it's even pretty stupid that they had forgotten all the ideas that already 300 years ago existed. So how come? This can't be the only meaning of the bicycle in those days because then it could never have been a commercial success. No, so here comes my point. This is what you see. This is the bicycle that you see. It's the dangerous bicycle. That's what you see if you look through the eyes of women. Now I'm going to tell you what you see if you look through the eyes of the people who actually used the bicycle. What they called in those days the young man of means and nerve. Athletic, young, upper-middle-class man. What you then see is the macho bicycle. <laughs> the macho bicycle actually worked very well. And it worked so well because it was risky to ride. If you wanted to impress your lady friends on Sunday morning on Hyde Park, in Hyde Park, then it better be a bit risky, otherwise they wouldn't be impressed. Around this bicycle, there was a whole culture of risk. Um, there, were, there were different ways of falling, for example. I don't know whether you have any experience with this windsurfing. There is the, that, that one plank and one sail, and you, 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 you sail by standing on top of it. It's much appreciated that if you, if you can't hold on and you fall, that you don't just, as a dummy, dump your bottom into the water, but you try to elegantly dive. It's exactly the same with the bicycle. There were various ways of falling. They had different names. For example, the imperial cropper meant that if you fell, then you would, were, supposed, were supposed to make a somersault 
and stand elegantly at the side of the road while your di bicycle was disappearing in the bushes. I found, I found an advertisement, an advertisement of one of the bicycle companies, the Humber Company, a very famous company that later continued to make motor cars. And that advertisement said, it, it reproduced, quasi, it reproduced the letter of a customer. And the customer said, Dear Mr. Humber, I bought one of your bicycles one and a half year ago and I'm very satisfied. I made 69 falls and there is no scratch on the lacquer. <laughs> he wasn't complaining about the falling. No, the falling was part of the whole deal. It was part of the culture. It was part of what this made a good working, a well working machine. So, just to summarize, the theory is if you want to describe some technology, identify relevant social groups, in this case the women and the young men of means that nerve, through the eyes of those relevant social groups you will see different technologies, in this case the unsafe machine and the macho machine. And what I've done now as a researcher, as a sociologist slash anthropologist slash historian, is that I demonstrated the interpretative flexibility of that technology. I apologize for the jargon, but it's crucial. I showed that there is not one ordinary bicycle, but actually there are two. And in practice, but my, my, my slide was full, in practice there are five, six, seven, depending on how many relevant social groups you identify. Now then the next step is to describe how that interpretive flexibility disappears. You know how the story continued. You know that in the end it was the unsafe bicycle that became dominant. Because the unsafe bicycle, that was the dominant, that at some point that became the dominant meaning, then it became urgent to make it more safe, then they started to invent, then they, they, they continued to invent uh, brakes, they lowered the front wheel, they found tricks to compensate for the, lowers, the lower front wheel and they got an, uh, a chain drive on the rear wheel. That's the rest of the story. That is what I call the social construction of the bicycle. But the whole point, and that is described with this concept, technological frame, I won't go into details, the point that I want to make mainly is that there is not only one technology, but really, if you look closely enough, and if you really understand what is happening around that technology, then there is interpretive flexibility. The interpretive flexibility means that it's not enough to ask the engineers. The engineers about the nuts and the bolts, but the nuts and the bolts are the same here and there. To understand the difference, the very different context of this bicycle, and how from that bicycle, in the end, we got what the historians call the safety bicycle, and that developed into the bicycle that we now have. You need the concept of interpretive flexibility, and in order to understand what happens around the, inter the, the interpretive flexibility, you need sociologists, anthropologists, historians, etc., etc. I'll skip this. We may return to it later uh, during the discussion. I'll tell you what it is about. I'm just to avoid your thinking that I'm only, that my claim about the social construction of technology is only about these old mechanical machines like bicycles. This is making the same argument, but then about internet protocols. And what the slide, I'm not going to do it in detail, but what the slide does is to show how one protocol, TCP IP, that's which is what all of us use when we email and we, when, and we, we browse the internet, and another protocol, X25, that's what all of us use when we go to an ATM machine or when we book, when we book uh, an, air, uh, an airline ticket, how both technologies end up in very different technical solutions of how to connect computers. And the only way to understand the difference between those two technologies, the virtual network, and the datagram network is by looking at the social shaping, by looking at the culture 
of, in this case, the PTTs, Post Telegraph and Telephone Companies, and in this case, the Ministry of Defense in the United States. So I'm not going to make the argument in any detail. My claim is that what I introduced to you with the help of the bicycle, I, in principle, am capable of doing with any technology. The video recorder, an ultrasound device, um, a microphone, and internet uh, protocols. Okay, so far I only talked about these machines. The bicycle, a protocol for computers. I now want to move further. I want to move to the technological uh, culture. If you really do your case study well, if you really do your anthropology and your history well, then you, you see much more than just the little context about that artifact. You really see the whole society around it. In case of bicycling, if you look well in Victorian times, then you see that the bicycle actually played a role in women emancipation. And you see the whole suffragette movement and the whole political debate of the role of women in society. You see it, as it were, through a an, 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 an microscopic glass when looking into the details of the bicycle. I'll show you two pictures. These are original well, cartoons, uh, pictures of those days. The caption, the text is also original. What is, what the, 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 the author, the drawer the, uh, does here is he compares um, the spinning wheel with the bicycle and he says this is the wheel of the past evidently that woman is wearing classic Victorian dress and that is the wheel of the future um, the woman is even wearing trousers which is which was pretty offensive in those days now the whole point is that for this author for this photographer evidently the bicycle was synonymous with progress with liberation, with women taking their fate in their own hands. Otherwise he wouldn't have used that icon of the bicycle. So just the fact that he used it like this, I'm saying he because I'm pretty sure that it was a he. Um, the fact that he used it shows that the bicycle had a much broader role than just a, mo a, a means of mobility. It played a role as an icon of liberation and progress. One more picture like that. She is leaving the house and says, will dinner be ready by six? I guess she would have said here, will dinner be ready by nine? But the basic message is the same. Um, he is doing the laundry. Um, again, she leaves the house with a bicycle in her hand, so it's the same icon of liberation, of leaving the house, of turning around, of the standard roles of men and women. And as a very nice footnote, there are two girls here. I think they are girls because of their dresses. And they're not playing with dolls, but they're playing with some technical contraption, which I think is a very nice footnote to the general argument about the women emancipation. So, what I've done, I started with talking about the culture of technology. I started by describing the culture around the bicycle or around software for making networks of computers but my argument is that if you do your job well if you look well enough into the details of the case study you are actually are studying technological culture so you start with a more narrow limited localized culture of technology if you do it well you're studying a much larger societal phenomena, and that's what I like to call technological culture. When I say we live in a technological culture, I'm saying two things. I'm arguing to my friends in sociology, anthropology, political sciences, don't think that you can understand society if you do not take into account the role that technology and science play. But I have an the mirror image to the engineers and the scientists. Don't think that you can build technical structures if you don't think about how they are embedded in society. So the message, the implicit 
political message of thinking about technological culture goes both ways. To the engineers it says, don't think that just engineering is enough. You need to think about a society in which your technology is going to function. But to the sociologists, it's exactly the same, but middle of the message. Don't think that it's enough to look at people, at social institutions. Nowadays, you have to look into the technology and the science as well. And my argument would apply to um, people who study literary. I think that you can't be a literary critic if you don't understand how metaphors that come from technology and science play a role in fiction and in poetry. The same applies to uh, composing modern Western music. You, much of the modern Western composers, and I, I'm ashamed to, to, to say that I don't know enough about, um, about Indian music. I think it doesn't apply there yet, actually. Um, you can't understand modern Western compositions if you don't realize that composers try to comment on, try to, to incorporate some of the noises, some of the sounds, some of the qualities of, um, of modern technological culture. But so what? What does it buy you? Why? Why would you care? Does it make it possible to do something differently in the world if you adapt this way of looking, would you have a different strategy to solve certain problems than before? That's what I'm trying. That's what I'm going to try to argue with two examples. You will probably remember 2005 in the summer, August, New Orleans was hit by the Hurricane Katrina. Um, many casualties, um, a pretty big disaster. Um, the Netherlands has kept its feet dry for more than 50 years. Um, several people, including governors, senators, members of the House, journalists from the United States, uh, concluded that evidently the Dutch know something that we Americans don't. The Dutch somehow are more clever, or at least the Dutch engineers are more clever than the American engineers. So let's all go to the Dutch. CNN came, the different networks came, the governor came. Uh, let's ask the Dutch to come to New Orleans and do a better job than the US Army Corps of Engineers has done so far. Is it really true that that very small country of the Netherlands is capable of doing more and better than the United States. There are times where I would like to believe that it's true. I don't think it's true. So my argument will be to show you that there is a different explanation and I can only make that explanation by drawing on my concept of technological culture. What I think is going on is that it's not a difference of the quality of the technology. It's not a difference of the quality of the engineers. No, what is going on is a difference in technological culture. It's a difference in how those two technological, those two technological cultures, the one in the United States, specifically New Orleans, the other in the Netherlands, deal with risk, particularly the risk of flooding <coughs> from sea. In the United States, the basic approach is literally summarized by themselves, by the Americans, is hazard mitigation. What they do is they invest in meteorological <coughs> prediction systems, satellite systems, measuring stations in the ocean, and they try to predict when a hurricane will hit so that they are better prepared. The course of the hurricane, the strength of the hurricane, the wind direction, etc. So prediction, meteorology. The second thing they invest, they invest in are evacuation plans. So if the thing is coming, how should we react? The third thing is huge insurance schemes. So there is a whole, a whole federally and state supported plan of insurance against flooding by hurricanes. Now all of that can be summarized as a strategy of hazard mitigation. The hazard is coming, no doubt, but let's try to mitigate it. Let's try to cope with it. Seems reasonable. 
What do the Dutch? The Dutch basically try to keep the water out. That's about it. It results in the Netherlands, um, in the law adopted with the unanimous vote in Parliament in 1954, in the law specifying that the, the chance that a dike breaks is one in 10,000. It's in the law. In the United States, the engineers work with the chance of breaking of levees and dikes of one, two, hundred. And it's not even in the law. It's just a professional code of engineers. So it's not only the difference between one, two, hundred and one, two, ten thousand, but it's also the way that that society has adopted that particular chance and code. Um, it, I don't want to make it sound better than it is. After New Orleans, the Netherlands decided, Holland decided, ah, it's pretty nasty what happened there. How are our evacuation plans? And they did a review of the evacuation plans of the Netherlands, and it became pretty clear that they were lousy. So, if something happens, and it's still possible, one to ten thousand is a small chance, but it may happen tomorrow. And if it happens tomorrow, then we're in deep, deep trouble. So, I don't want to make it sound very heroic and very good, it's just a different choice. It's a different choice of technological culture to focus on hazard mitigation or to focus on keeping the water out. But once you've seen that, then it becomes much more understandable that things go the way they go in New Orleans and things go the way they go in the Netherlands. But it has implications for policy. The implication is that it is not very sensible to just take Dutch technology and dump it in New Orleans. Because they don't have the kind of technological culture that can deal with that kind of technology. They, they, don't, have, they don't have the same way of thinking about water as the Dutch have. So the basic conclusion is that if you really would want to use Dutch technologies in New Orleans, as they actually are doing, we're making a lot of money there at the moment, uh, it, you, it's not enough to build Dutch dikes and to build Dutch storm surge barriers and that sort of thing. Now you really have to accompany that with education, with uh, plans of how to maintain it, with lots of facilities and small firms that can do the maintenance. So there needs to be much more than just the artifact. You actually, to put it in one sentence, have to change the technological culture of New Orleans. And if you can't do that, then there's only very limited use of the new and very sophisticated high uh, technologies that they import from the Netherlands. Second example. Is it possible To make that argument, that is a very good idea. The different conception of sustainability. I think we need that anyway, whether you're talking about handloom or about, um, say, maintaining the Netherlands below sea level. I want to make an argument that we need something much broader than only financial sustainability. I think generally if people talk about sustainability, not in the ecological sense, but say sustainability the way that NGOs in India talk about it when they have discussions about handloom or about um, organic farming or something like that. They basically mean financial sustainability. Is it possible for a weaver or a cooperative to sustain itself financially? I think we need a broader concept. I think that this by itself is not enough to describe what we really value and what we want to maintain and to keep sustainable. Because if you lose a particular technology, that, and so I'm coming back to my concept of technological culture, if you lose a particular technology, you also lose the culture around it. It's not just an artifact that you throw out of the window. Now you throw a whole culture out of the window, and my argument is we should, we being society at large, societies, plural, cultures, should think very carefully and politically whether we really want that part of society being disappearing. Um, 
let me briefly make, I hope I can move this thing back too, just very briefly a picture of the Netherlands. This is the Netherlands. This is actually why my university is high and dry, because everything which is red would be underwater if we take away the dikes. So roughly 50% of the Netherlands is below sea level and would disappear when we skip the dikes. Now, the Netherlands are sustainable at the moment. We sustain them with all these dikes. Are the Netherlands financially sustainable? No, definitely not. It's pretty expensive to have all those dikes and to maintain them, particularly with the 1 to 10,000 um, uh, chance of breaking. It's really much cheaper to just move this bit into Germany and buy land. The square meter price of land here is a lot cheaper than maintaining all those dikes. So clearly the Netherlands, Holland, is not financially sustainable. So if you would kick the Netherlands out of the window, or put it different, why don't we do that? I mean, the Dutch are known for their trader's instinct, so if we can make a profit, why would we not do it? Why wouldn't we indeed give up the whole western part and buy land in Germany? Well, my argument is basically because we don't want to give up the culture that goes with it. So the sustainability of the Netherlands, you cannot understand if you only look at the financial aspect. You have to look at the culture, the religion, the arts, the social institutions, etc. That only can make you understand why the Netherlands is sustainable. Okay. So back Shall we just swap this track? together. Why would we want it? So I'm arguing that we need forms of sustainability that include that. If we do that seriously, we need other definitions of productivity and efficiency to get away from the, the simple-minded, narrow-minded financial uh, dimension. Now, with that concept in mind, with that broader concept of sustainability in mind, let's again ask the question, is it possible or do we wish, does India wish, we don't have any, we were too late in the Netherlands, we used to have hand glue, we don't have it anymore. Is India prepared to make the political decision to have sustainable handloom? Now my argument is that handloom evokes the producer, the community that produced it, the technological culture around the handloom, even the knowledge that is in this weaving community. It evokes it in an almost unspeakable, implicit way. If you, if you look women coming into the Dharam shop, of Dasta Karandra, you see them going into the shop and, and almost without noticing, touching, touching the fabric and feeling it. When they do that, and when they decide to buy a certain sari, they, they know that they buy the culture from where that sari is coming from. They know that they do much more than just a certain, a certain pattern, a certain color. That is part of the culture of hand loop. It is part of the culture of textiles in a way that mill production can never capture. So, applying the broad concept of sustainability, the question is, don't we want a balance? Do, don't you want, as Indians, I have no stake in this, don't you want, as Indians, as Indian cultures, political culture, don't you want a broad range of textiles where the mill textile and the power loom and the hand loom are all part of it. And my argument is that you need the hand loom to keep that broader culture of appreciation of what quality of cloth is that also allows you to have the mill and the power loom. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sort of old-fashioned traditionalist that argues against mill textiles. No, I'm making the argument that if you lose handloom, you lose much more than just that kind of fabric. You lose a kind of knowledge and a kind of culture to deal with textiles that actually would um, make, would, would, would impoverish the culture of India in dealing even with mill textiles. So, my conclusion is that Actually, you need handloom 
in order to have a sustainable, in the broader sense of the word, a sustainable form of textile culture in India. Not just handloom sustainable, but the broader culture, with the aesthetics, with the knowledge, with the feel of the fabric. I know that you only really listen if there's nothing to see there. So my conclusion, basically, is technology is too important to leave to engineers. Lawyers, accountants, school children should pay attention to technology if they want to understand their world and to make a better world. And vice versa. Engineers should pay attention to culture, to democracy, to justice, to what their technologies do to the community if they want to do a proper job. Thank you very much. Until there is a question, and then I'll get up. That was uh, a very interesting exposition of uh, an aspect of uh, how the society works and how uh, we need to look at things. Uh, very interesting. Thank you very much, Professor Baikar. All yours, ladies and gentlemen. Ravi, <coughs> come part. Here, you can take this. Was uh, discussing uh, probably this is slightly out of uh, what you have uh, spoken about. Uh, one of my professors uh, used to discuss uh, that uh, uh, every technological advancement is always met with uh, a mixed bag of reactions. Uh, some good, some uh, some some sort of protest in some cases. Accepting the advancement in photography and music. Would you have anything to comment on it? Yes, yes. I think it's a very nice, it's a very nice question because um, your professor seemed very sensible. I mean, there's nothing against this. I agree with it. The, the implicit assumption, the, the, the kind of language in which he phrases this point, is as if technology is just coming. And then it will have good effects, it will have bad effects. My argument against this colleague would be that's the wrong way of conceptualizing technology. Technology just does not just arrive and then have advantages and disadvantages. Technology is socially shaped. So don't just think about how to react to the advantages and the disadvantages. Think much earlier, much more upstream about how to shape the technology and how to politically and, 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 and democratically etc. Uh, intervene in it. So, yes, technologies have all these effects, but the core message is technologies are not autonomous and they don't come over us. They don't roll over us, but we can, if we are clever enough, we can keep trying, at least, at least, try to keep a little bit of control. Is technology shaped better by political intervention or by market intervention? Do people shape technology better by the way they buy, by the way they choose to spend? or through the kind of things that you said, you know, upstream political intervention? Um, if you allow me, I'll first make, well, that's what, that's what you get when you, when you hire a professor. I'll first make a sort of principal remark and then I'll answer your question. The principal remark is that I don't want to talk in terms of better and worse. If you take my argument seriously, then the better I mean, the bicycle was better for the young man of means that were, and, 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 and nerve, the young athletic man, and it was pretty bad for the woman. So, the technology as such was not better in a simple way. You can only answer the question about the quality of the technology very local. If you, if you ask the people that the culture, the society, the part of society that has to work with it. So, I have a problem with, with the better and the worse. But I do have an answer to your question too. And that is that I think that you need to do both. I'm, I think you need to take very seriously market forces, economics, marketing, etc. But I wouldn't. I, I don't want to leave it there. If you leave for for two for two very straightforward reasons. One reason if if you leave it to the market forces, you're too late, because lots of things already have happened. Investments have been made, um, and and you can't you can't turn that back. 
So that is one reason why you need to intervene much more earlier. And the second is that I have a fairly naive but profound idea about de democracy. And I don't like a democracy that votes with its feet or with its wallet. I want a democracy that votes on the basis of arguments and, and morals and debate. And that's the second reason why I want politics to be involved, but not to the exclusion of the economics. Uh, technology does, does not develop autonomously. Uh, are you saying that it's dictated by uh, uh, by demands from the market, as uh, my friend said, that, uh, or uh, it is dictated by uh, choices that uh, that uh, those who govern make policy? No, I think I think it's more complicated. Certainly, the market forces play a role, but um, uh, but there's more going on. Um, it's only a half serious example, um, but uh, the history of the of the personal computer um, uh, had several players: IBM, uh, Apple, a few others. Um, I'm pretty sure that not only today Apple is better than, than than Windows, but even in those days. And IBM knew. So what did IBM? They they basically forced the universities with whom they had contracts for the mainframe computers, they forced universities to buy their PCs. That created an enormous force in the market, that created Microsoft coming to them and, and developing MS-DOS, etc., etc. Um, so that, that was an intervention, in a way a market intervention, but it was not the market demand that created that. It certainly was not the quality of the technology that created it. So my, my, my answer would be, to understand the development of technology, you, yes, you need to look into the market. Yes, you need to look into the quality of, 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 of the technology. You need engineers, too, to do this job. But you also need to look into, into, into strategies of marketing, into social, social circumstances, culture, etc. That's the only way to understand the development of technology. Market forces is certainly not enough. There are enough examples of, um, of, 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 of market questioning, but uh, market demand, but not creating the development of technology. Uh, the, uh, I have a question on this, how technology destroys cultures. Because uh, when we are saying that the, the uh, I mean, you talk about technological culture, but my opinion is that the force of technology is so high that uh, over a period of time, especially the last 50 years, it is destroying local cultures and it is very much as how an American would think or how I would think or what a Chinese would think. It will be very similar because technology is destroying our culture and we all have access to similar information. Having said that, yeah, I think it will be uh, more easy for us to integrate into a technological culture when there is democracy. But it, suppose you are from China where there is a large internet police and they don't provide access to information and there is not a functioning democracy it is a little more difficult. But how long can they stop? So I, I'm saying two things. One, technology actually destroys culture and forms a culture of its own. And we are explaining it away as technological culture. The second thing is, I think that political processes delay technology, technological destruction of culture. Am I right? 